Welcome to this FIA and Center on U.S. Power and Politics Transatlantic Currents event. Uh, today we're going to talk about, well, the way ahead after the Biden-Putin summit. I am Charlie Sonis Pasternak. I'm the head of CUSP. Um, but none of you came here to listen to me, but rather um, our hostess, as it were, of the day. Uh, she's also a former ambassador, uh, Deborah McCarthy. She's currently a visiting fellow at Harvard. Uh, she was the U.S. ambassador to Lithuania 2013 to 2016. And one of the things I can encourage you to do that you, she is hosting right now is a podcast series, A General and the Ambassador. Uh, the most recent episodes were excellent ones on Iraq and then South Korea. Um, administratively, please remember, keep your cameras closed and type your questions into chat from where I will take them. Take it away, Deborah. Thank you, Charlie. And thanks once again to FIA for hosting this series. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Ambassador John Teft, who preceded me as the U.S. Ambassador to Lithuania. He's had an extraordinary career, 45 years in the U.S. diplomatic service. He was ambassador to the Russian Federation, 2014-2017, to Ukraine, 2009-2013, to, to Georgia, 2005-2009, to and, as I mentioned, Lithuania. Each time I ran into him in the hallways at the State Department, he was heading off to another ambassadorship. I wanted to start this conversation by welcoming Ambassador Teft and all our guests and looking at the topic under discussion today from a sort of macro point of view to begin and specifically looking at it in the context, the, the, the Putin-Biden meeting in the context of U.S. national security interests as outlined in the current interim U.S. national security strategy. The strategy terms Russia as a destabilizer, as a disruptor, but not as a peer competitor. So Ambassador, let's start with the following. What in your view is the Biden administration's strategy vis-a-vis -vis Russia and how was it reflected in the recent meetings in Europe? The G7, the US EU summit, obviously the NATO summit, and then in the bilateral meeting. Well, thank you, Deborah, and uh, hello, everyone. It's great to be with you all today. Uh, I think the what we saw unfold, uh, not just with the meeting with Putin, but really the six or seven days that Joe Biden was uh, on this trip to Europe, was a pretty carefully crafted strategy, which I wouldn't be surprised went back even into the uh, pre-Biden administration to the preparation period. Uh, Obviously, the key things he tried to accomplish were to restore America's uh, relationships with uh, our European friends and allies, just as he's trying to do with Japan and Korea. Uh, you saw the strategy of going first to the, do the G7, then to NATO, then EU consultations, and finally with Putin uh, unfold. I think pretty much as the Biden administration wanted it to. Uh, the I think sometimes our friends in the press have kind of misinterpreted uh, this. This was not a traditional summit in the sense that the bureaucracies and the arms control negotiators work like crazy to prepare uh, agreements uh, to sign or to announce. The, the famous State Department word, which I still find a little crazy, deliverables. Uh, this was all about Joe Biden trying to lay down a base for his relationship with Russia and with Vladimir Putin. There was very little expected at the beginning, and uh, I think what came out of it was pretty much what I expected. The two men had a pretty decent, straightforward discussion. It was based on a fundamental understanding, I think on both sides, that we have very different uh, interests uh, as things have uh, unfolded under the Putin administration. And we have very different values, I think, as we've seen in human rights and other things like that. What we've got are a couple of agreements for further talks, these strategic stability talks, which will hopefully lead to a new round of arms control negotiations, and we can talk about that. We've got the effort to try to stop some of these cyber attacks. And it sounds like Biden put down the markers pretty clearly to Putin that he, these may be private people, but nothing is private in Russia and that he has a responsibility to stop these people. Uh, and then I think you've seen, uh, I'm sure they had a pretty decent 
perhaps a tough exchange on a number of the issues like Ukraine, uh, where we have uh, very profound differences. European security, I would argue, uh, Ukraine and the Russian invasion in 2014, it, it's not just about Ukraine, it's about the whole European security system, and I'd be happy to talk about that. In a nutshell, one pun that I read the other day said we're, we've gone back to the future. Or as John McLaughlin, the former head of the CIA, uh, or one of the deputy directors of the CIA, one of the main analysts wrote this uh, past week, we've, uh, we've gone back to the normal, uh, the period in effect almost during the Soviet period, where we've agreed to disagree and, and we've tried to manage in as predictable and safe manner as possible the U.S.-Russian relationship, and more broadly, the, the Western relationship with Russia. Deborah, I can't hear you. I've lost the sound. I wanted to follow up and ask specifically on these two areas in which some, I wouldn't say agreement, but a, an agreement to continue discussions uh, was arrived at. And on the nuclear arms control side, the aim is to hold a dialogue to replace the 2010 START treaty. How rapidly, in your view, can both sides come to some agreement? In other words, is, are there prospects for completing something under the Biden administration? Well, I'd like to think so, uh, although uh, I, I understand from some my own history uh, and involvement with arms control negotiations back in the Reagan administration that this really takes uh, a long and uh, often torturous time. Uh, first of all, we've got to have these strategic stability talks. I think the Biden administration is still in the process of formulating its own position when it comes to uh, both nuclear and, for that matter, space and cyber uh, weapons to see how and what uh, we pursue with Russia in terms of uh, negotiating limits, confidence building measures, whatever you want. What complicates the nuclear side is that you have a whole group of new technologies mm -hmm. which are going to kind of uh, really take us back to kind of fundamental definitional uh, issues. Uh, these hypersonic weapons that Russia has, and I think we have them too, uh, Russia is very concerned about uh, our own ability to uh, do launch standoff conventional uh, weapons. And there's a whole array of other kind of cascading problems that are going to have to be worked out, and you're then going to have to find a way to verify that these agreements are going to be uh, correct. So there's a huge amount of technical work as we've moved, I think, in the, into another uh, generation, if you will, of these weapons. Now, cyber, uh, I'm not an expert on this, but the guys, the people who are experts, who I read, uh, still are very skeptical that we can even find some of the, the fundamentals here because neither side wants to negotiate and in the process disclose what capabilities they have. Now, I think both sides probably have a pretty good sense, but how far are you going to limit things of a technology that's obviously still kind of developing day by day? So this is going to be a big effort. I'd like to th see something done in the first administration uh, of George, uh, Joe Biden, but uh, I think prudence tells us that we, we, we shouldn't be surprised if it goes longer. Well, on the cyber side, um, the Biden administration did indicate certain sectors which were off limits to attacks and also noted that we, you know, we have formidable capabilities. For our audience, I note that in uh, 2018, the Department of Defense adopted a defend forward strategy to disrupt or halt malicious cyber activity at its source. And in the recent interim national security strategy, the Biden administration also made it clear that it will hold actors accountable and respond swiftly and proportionally to cyber attacks. So on this, in this area, do you sense that the Biden administration sort of drew a red line and a red line on on cyber? Yeah, I think I think uh, they did. In a way, it's uh, kind of a a new uh, concept of deterrence. Uh, on the one hand, Biden gave Putin a list of 16 areas that uh, we should consider off limits in terms of cyber attacks, things that affect fundamental human life in in uh, in all of our countries. But I think at the same time, he made it quite clear in his comments that the U.S. has the capabilities 
to respond and to uh, to deal with the Russian cyber attacks. And I think uh, there was indication to me that, that 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 was one of the firmest messages that Biden presented to Putin inside Geneva, and I'm sure that Putin understood that. Uh, so hopefully, you know, we'll start to see the end of some of these cyber attacks that take down commercial enterprises like the uh, the pipeline that uh, went down a couple of uh, about a month ago, uh, but also to stop these attacks uh, on the U.S. government agencies, to stop the attacks on dem- uh, political parties, not just in the United States, but throughout Europe. But uh, there's going to be a long way to go here. I think both uh, I think Biden did uh, draw the line very clearly and. Uh, you know, Putin responded to the whole meeting saying this was a very effective conversation. I think he must have gotten the message very, very clearly. I've been in meetings during my career with Joe Biden, and he knows how to draw the line uh, on these kinds of issues, uh, but to do it in a very business-like fashion, which I think is what happened at this summit. Well, many other topics were also covered during the Geneva meeting, and I want to highlight one, which was the Arctic. Finland has just recently released its Arctic, its new Arctic strategy. The U.S. has an overall Arctic strategy and an increasing military footprint in the region. Russia has just become its chair, has just begun its chairmanship of the Arctic Council. Now, under the Trump administration, Secretary Pompeo urged the Arctic Council to focus on great power competition in the region, but the Biden administration is calling for the council to return to its more traditional focus. So, John, you know the Arctic and Arctic politics, and in your view, is this a region of potential cooperation or competition with Russia? Deborah, I've always thought that this was an area of uh, uh, cooperation uh, that where we could find uh, both in the Arctic Council and even bilaterally areas where we could work with uh, not just Russia, but all of the countries that are members of the Arctic Council. I go back to uh, the period in the early 90s in the Clinton administration when I was the head of the Northern Europe office, and uh, I was the U.S. representative at a meeting, uh, the inaugural meeting of the Barents Regional Council in Kirkenes, Mm -hmm. Norway, at the top of Norway in January, uh, when uh, the foreign ministers of Russia and uh, many of the other uh, Arctic countries uh, met to kind of lay out uh, a new path forward of cooperation. I think the Russians have moved pretty steadily to try to build up their military bases in uh, the, the region. They obviously put great stock in the uh, the northern sea route to find a way to uh, uh, move uh, cargoes through there because it shortens the distance from going all around, uh, going through the Suez Canal uh, or even further. Uh, and I hope that that we can find a way to cooperate. Um, the United States really, uh, we've done for years exercises with our Norwegian allies. The Marines go in up in northern, and this has been a contingency exercise going back as long as I can remember. But the fact is we have we don't have icebreakers. We don't have the kind mm. of military capability uh, in the region that Russia has. I think the key issue here is, is Russia going to try to militarize this even more in the sense that they're going to claim uh, that sea lane up there as their uh, territory. As we've seen with Ukraine and other areas, Russia has this proclivity, shall we say, under President Putin, at least in the last uh, the last 15 years, to try to broaden its so-called spheres of influence and areas of it, of, of control. So I think the real uh, problem here is to try to find a way to to, to work cooperatively, because the, the Arctic Council has done a lot of really good things. Uh, the indigenous peoples who live, whether they're in Alaska and northern Finland and uh, in uh, northern Russia uh, or other Scandinavian countries, everywhere I've been, I've met with these people. And they've always thought that this, the Arctic Council and some of the programs that the Arctic Council has pursued have really been good for them and for their communities. Those are the kinds of things, the people-to-people stuff that I'd really like to see, to see more of. Um, but I have this underlying fear, and I think this is what animates the Biden administration. I don't think they have any desire to make this into kind of an area of military cooperation, but I think they are worried about uh, what uh, the real intentions of uh, Russia are at the current time. Well, I wanted to move now to the issue of the use of sanctions by the uh, Biden administration. 
Um, they issued a broad package of sanctions on Russia in March in relation to the poisoning of Navalny. An additional set of sanctions was imposed in April in retaliation for the SolarWinds attack, the 2020 election interference, and other Russian actions. And recently, National Security Advisor Sullivan said the administration is preparing yet another set of sanctions in response to Russia's use of chemical weapons against Navalny. Separately on Nord Stream 2, the administration sanctioned certain entities and ships, but he decided not to impose sanctions on the CEO of the company behind the Nord Stream pipeline. And newspapers reported that the president overrode the State Department on this issue. So I wanted to start with the following. How do you assess the effectiveness of US and EU sanctions on Russia in terms of the ultimate objective of sanctions, which is to change behavior? Well, I think I'd start by challenging your last statement because I'm not sure, uh, to be honest, that uh, it was very realistic to somehow think we were going to be able to change uh, Vladimir Putin's behavior. Uh, there's a wonderful book called The, La the, the, the Last Tsar by uh, Stephen Lee Myers, the Washington or the New York Times correspondent for a long time in Moscow, now in Beijing. And it's a great exposition of how Putin developed as a young man on the streets of Leningrad and how he then went into the KGB and how his views, many of which we see manifested today, were formed during that period. This is a tough guy, and the last thing he, he would always he would ever do would be back down from a fight. And so I think the idea that we're going to get necessarily a behavior modification uh, is probably a little bit... Uh, too hopeful for Vladimir Putin. That said, the sanctions have had a very serious impact on Russia. When I was in Moscow from 2014 to 2017, most of the really good analysts, whether they be Russians or uh, Europeans or Americans, felt that the combination of the sanctions with Putin's reluctance to move forward in obvious areas of economic reform and his friend Alexei Kudrin used to lay this out over and over again in speeches there. But in addition, uh, you know, all these things plus the lack of investment uh, mm. had a, a very serious impact on Russia. Now, you're the economist, Deborah, not me, but I think that the sanctions have had a very uh, clear impact on deterring. Uh, certainly American and European investment. It's combined with a number of other factors as Russia has become more repressive. But investment has not only flowed in, not flowed in, but it's uh, it's actually flowed out of Russia. And uh, I think it, the sanctions, in short, have contributed to this larger economic malaise, which uh, is a real problem for Putin. You put COVID and all of the implications for the Russian economy uh, caused by COVID, and you've got a really serious effort. Now, the last point I would make is that sanctions are the go-to uh, tech, technique, the go-to uh, method of trying to impact or change behavior, but they're also a way to signal political views. And, you know, the problem is that there's not a lot of tools at that level. But above sanctions, you basically got to go to military power. And nobody wants to go to military power, not the Russians, not the Europeans, not the United States. So I think you, you end up with sanctions. And uh, in some, some days, I, I sometimes wonder if we have almost too many sanctions. But as Russia continues these very repressive policies, efforts to try to uh, extend its control and influence into uh, not just uh, what it calls the near abroad, but even to impact the countries of Central uh, and Eastern Europe, uh, developing democracies through cyber warfare. Um, you know, this is there, there's no other real uh, method by which to signal and to send a, uh, as clear a message as possible to the Russian leadership that they have gone uh, beyond uh, the line. And so uh, it's uh, sanctions are a difficult, concrete issue, but I, I've looked at this pretty carefully, and I'm pretty sure that uh, it has had an impact, and it does factor into Putin's decision making. And perhaps uh, pushes him, pulls him back from making uh, silly uh, moves that would be, in fact, very dangerous for uh, Europe and ultimately for Russia itself. Because there's also, as you know, a lot of issue, a lot of sanctions that are out there on the table. And I think President Biden 
reminded Putin of that in the meeting in Geneva that uh, that the United States and Europe could go to, uh, particularly in the issues of banking, as well as in the uh, in terms of energy and other things that Russia needs very desperately to be able to continue even to main its, maintain its current modicum of a stagnant economy. And it is true that we have developed, especially because of Iran, we've developed some amazing capacities and capabilities on sanctions that didn't exist, you know, 15 years ago. Well, I, 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 I agree, Deborah, with that. And I think that's, in fact, one of, you know, one of the things that uh, drove Putin from at least some of the Russian commentators that I have read. Uh, mm-hmm. He's well aware that we have a greater capability there, just like we do in the cyber area. So developing a relationship which is more predictable, I think, works for him uh, as well as it works for Joe Biden. And the partnership we have, obviously, with our European allies has been helpful in in doing this in a combined fashion. Well, I wanted to turn now um, to another issue. Um, During the uh, meeting in Geneva, there was also an agreement to return ambassadors. You were ambassador to Russia during the major cutbacks of personnel with diplomats being ejected on both sides. And you've also recounted in one of our podcasts under the general and the ambassador, the unbelievable amount of harassment of your team and U.S. personnel during your time. Um, What have been the effects of these cutbacks in terms of the U.S.'s ability to analyze what is happening inside of Russia, politically, economically? I think that they've had some impact, particularly uh, because our ambassador and our uh, embassy officers, uh, the fewer number of them, have not been able to travel as much as we certainly were able to do when I was ambassador 2014 to 2017. But COVID uh, obviously had another, it was another major factor, perhaps even more important than uh, any political effort that was being made. The, uh, we have a, a wonderful stable of foreign service officers uh, who, not just at the senior level, but also coming up through the system, who really understand Russia, who've served there, and uh, who I think uh, are still doing a good job for the administration, for our country, in terms of analyzing what exactly is going on inside of Russia. For me, the biggest problem uh, with the cutback in personnel is, is going to be the in- inability to, uh, to travel, perhaps, as much, because we won't have as pe- many people there to do that. Now, I suspect that's at the root of part of Russia's uh, uh, game here, because they're, in many ways, trying to isolate Russia from the rest of the world. If you stop and look at it, a combination of different things, both limiting travel and uh, harassing people when they do travel. And it didn't affect just us. It affected the EU uh, mission in Russia, even when I was there, but it was also uh, uh, different European uh, uh, countries' embassies. Mm -hmm. The the effort was made to... uh, to try to stop uh, contacts between academics. There's a whole series of cases uh, that have been brought to court by the FSB, uh, which I think have had a very intimidating effect on Russian academics and uh, I think even businessmen. And so as Russia moves to control itself, uh, control the situation internally, and we've seen the repressive tactics used in demonstrations, there's also been this uh, effort to try to cut off, um, in, in, in many ways, contacts with the West. Now, I think Joe Biden did the right thing by raising this issue in Geneva, as I understand it, and I think we're going to have, we're going to see this summer, negotiations uh, on how to try to allow our embassies to do their work, as, as, the, as President Biden said. And I mm-hmm. think that uh, right now, uh, Russia still considers us a, quote, unfriendly power uh, and is still talking about having all of the Russian employees at our embassy leave, uh, or, uh, have their employment terminated on August the 1st. Now, this will obviously hurt our ability to be in touch with Russians, but it will also hurt Russia. Uh, as we saw very uh, earlier in the summer, when the administration announced that we were going to stop doing visas because we, we, our Russian employees are some of the key people in terms of processing the visas to comply with U.S. law, immediately the, 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 there was a very sharp reaction in Russia. Uh, 
And I think uh, we're going to have to work that out. Right now, I think there's something like 340 Russian employees at their embassies and consulates here in the United States. If we take away the American, uh, the uh, Russian employees uh, at our embassy in Moscow, because our consulates in Yekaterinburg and Vladivostok have really been already pulled back because of the problems with COVID, we're going to have 100 people. Um, and we're not going to be able to do the work. And we can't train up Americans and get them and their families out there uh, anywhere near uh, with the speed that uh, that uh, it just takes time. So I think you're going to have a situation that's going to be, unless it's unless they can negotiate some changes to this, it's going to be very difficult, and it's going to be difficult for the Russian government and people uh, to do this. The last thing I'll say is, if in fact this goes forward, I can't imagine that the U.S. Congress is going to sit by and watch Russia mm -hmm. have 340 people here and uh, we have 100 or less in Moscow. There's going to be other uh, ramifications to this. I don't know that, but uh, just based on my experience, uh, I, I, can't, I can only imagine uh, the kinds of proposals that will come forward. Right. Well, during your time in Russia, you worked closely with your European counterparts, including the Finnish ambassador, who is now the Finnish ambassador to the United States. Um, at the US-EU summit, which preceded the Biden-Putin meeting, uh, the US and the EU agreed to set up a new US-EU high-level dialogue on Russia. They also jointly condemned Russia's actions to undermine Ukraine and Georgia and the uh, crackdown on civil society and opposition internally. How important is US-EU coordination on the ground in Russia? And do you think this new dialogue will achieve anything? Well, I hope so. I, I'm one of those who has always worked with and believed in the US-EU uh, working together in, uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, when I was ambassador in Lithuania, as we were uh, negotiating uh, uh, Lithuania's uh, efforts to become a member of NATO, coterminous with that was the, uh, uh, the effort to negotiate the acquis communautaire uh, with the EU. Uh, and, you know, I worked very closely with the EU ambassadors uh, to make sure we understood what was going on in uh, each of our bilateral or uh, EU and American dialogues. And that's continued, whether it was in uh, Georgia before and during the war in 2008. I worked very closely with the EU. Uh, not uh, Peter Semnaby was the EU rep in the Caucasus in those days, a wonderful Swedish diplomat. Uh, Carl Bildt was regularly uh, there, along with many Finnish uh, uh, diplomats. Terry Hakala was the OSCE rep in, in Georgia in that time. Uh, and it continued working in, in Ukraine. Uh, the EU was negotiating the association agreement, which in the end Yanukovych rejected. But uh, it was a wonderful EU mission there, and uh, many EU officials would come, and I would often get invited to kind of join kind of analytical sessions in preparation for going in for those discussions. Now in Moscow, uh, again, I've al we've always worked very carefully. Vigados Ushatskas, who was the EU representative, head of the EU mission in uh, Moscow during my tenure. Uh, he and I are old friends from Lithuania, uh, but we worked very, very closely together uh, on different things, sharing assessments and uh, trying to make sure that we had a kind of a common uh, approach, shall we say, recognizing that, you know, the EU and the United States have sometimes differing views. But I think it's absolutely essential, and I was really pleased to see the decision that we would have this group to kind of coordinate policy, because I think it's just a, a natural uh, way to approach the issue, to make sure we understand each other, that we're coordinated to the extent possible. Um, and frankly, it's it's brought together wonderful diplomats, European diplomats and American diplomats over the years to try to uh, uh, to try to push forward our common goals. Last word I would say is that uh, many of these European uh, diplomats, both uh, bilaterally but also within the EU context, have been Finns that uh, during my career, and I count as one of my great. Uh, one of the great pleasures of my uh, time, the friendships that I have developed with many Finnish diplomats. Miko Hautala, who's now here, uh, is, of course, a good example 
but uh, uh, I mentioned Terry Hakala and uh, uh, Marcos Lira, uh, many, many more who I have worked with uh, in Finland. I have great admiration for them as diplomats, but I also have great admiration for Finnish uh, diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis Russia and uh, the understanding that uh, Finnish diplomats have of what's going on inside of Russia. Absolutely. I wanted to turn now to uh, over to Charlie because I see some questions, a number of questions have come in. So let us turn it over to our attendees uh, to have their questions answered. Well, great. Thank you, both ambassadors. I have, as, as you can see, a number of questions, and we're going to start with another Finnish diplomat um, and uh, Moscow hand. So Hannu Himanen um, mm -hmm. says, John, how seriously do you think the Kremlin will engage in the complex and time-consuming negotiation processes as opposed to being in abeyance or delaying serious engagement until the elections of 2024? And then regards Hannu Himanen. Well, hi, Hanu. It's great to uh, to know that you're on the uh, on the call today, and uh, I look forward at some point when all of this COVID stuff gets sorted out to uh, to get to Finland and to see you and so many of my other friends. I think that the uh, Russians will uh, push ahead. Uh, my own interpretation of last year's uh, constitutional amendments was that this was an attempt by Putin to basically buy time. I think he looked at the political elites, and he already saw them starting to jockey for position vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, uh, uh, you know, who, who would be the successor to Putin, what was going to happen. And this involved power, it involves politics, it involves, involves money. Um, Putin has now put that off. Uh, uh, I'm not sure I would take a big bet on him staying around until 2036, but he's certainly bought time. And I think uh, you will see him try to move forward on a number of these areas, whether we can achieve it, whether the, the substantial differences uh, that we have on a whole variety of issues can be bridged, I'm not sure. But I think it's in his interest uh, to try to find a way to uh, to 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 be blunt, to limit the Americans in some of the things that we are able to do, uh, that we're planning to do. Uh, I think it's also, it works to his advantage inside of Russia to show the Russian people that he's, that uh, the United States and Russia are engaged and that he is engaged with Joe Biden. It plays to uh, uh, not, not only to the his perception among the Russian people, but particularly his perception among the Russian elites, who will in the end be the ones who will be the final determinants of uh, who his successor will be. Well, I'd, I had a clarification from, from Hanu. I, he had the U.S. presidential elections in mind. So are they, uh, is well, Putin hoping for a return of Trump or, or, or one of his kids? <laughs> so, sorry, Hanu. I, uh, I think that, uh, I think Joe Biden will go flat out. Uh, you know, I never heard anybody say this, uh, but I suspect that, you know, given that he's 78 and obviously doing well, even Putin uh, uh, put down all of the Russian propagandists who were saying this is an old senile man. You know, he he found out uh, firsthand and said so publicly. I think that uh, that said, Biden, is, uh, I'm not sure he will. He says he's going to run again, but uh, I think we're not going to know that for a while. And I think what you see both domestically in the States and also in his foreign policy so far is a clear effort by President Biden to try to get as much done to recast things as possible. Now, in terms of American politics, uh, it's anybody's guess what's going to happen with President Trump. Uh, we've got the governor of Florida, the former vice president, Mr. Pence, and others who are already jockeying for position to be the candidates to run in 2024, whoever it is, whether it's Joe Biden or perhaps Kamala Harris uh, or perhaps somebody else. It's not clear at this point. But I think you, you won't see... Uh, you won't see Joe Biden pulling back. Uh, he, he's, I think he knows he's got at least these four years and he wants to, he wants to be this transitional president. He wants to be uh, a man who resets things in America, who resets American foreign policy and tries to the extent he can to institutionalize uh, a whole series of changes. And above all, to, uh, to revivify uh, American democracy and democracy in the world. He said it over and over again, and I think that is one of the things that really animates him. Right. 
Thank you. You have uh, three other questions. I'll take them one at a time. Sanctions, uh, military exercises, and then kind of internal Kremlin power dynamics. A uh, question from Christian Numelin is, um, but the new sanctions, which Sullivan mentioned, do you expect them to be rather mild or more harsh? You know, I don't know the answer to that question. These, Deborah mentioned this before, the, these sanctions are required under law. And in fact, the administration has not uh, met the deadline. Uh, these are required because Novichok that was used against Navalny is a chemical weapon. The law that the United States has requires us to impose sanctions on Russia uh, for that. So it's not something that's a totally voluntary uh uh, thing for the Biden administration to come up with. Uh, they're required to do this under American law. Uh, if I had to guess, and I have no uh, basis to go beyond just a guess, is that uh, that they will be uh, they'll be significant, but they won't be catastrophic from the Russian standpoint, because I think Biden wants to see if the, these efforts the that he has made in Geneva with Putin to lay down the basis for a, a more predictable uh, future to, to engage in some of these talks that have been scheduled. I think you'll want to see how those go. But specifically what they're going to do, I, I, I just don't know. And I haven't seen anything in the press uh, that indicates exactly where they are. And perhaps Deborah knows. I, I, I just don't know. Thank you. Well, I guess we, we will see. Um, Next question about military exercises and, and the upcoming Zapad 2021. Um, some elements of these military exercises, could they be present in the Arctic as, well, uh, Marian Siemenkovic writes, uh, supposedly happened in 2017, a uh, kind of simulation of the invasion of Svalbard or something. Um, mm -hmm. And if I can add a further question, um, how much do you think, um, kind of U.S., Europe, other um, analysts um, understand the background of these exercises on the public side. As I understand on the kind of the secret side, uh, Russia is potentially a little bit more open with some people about what they're doing and when. But on the public side, of course, very opaque. Yeah. Well, they've been doing the Zapad exercises for a long, long time. And uh, I think we always, uh, we meaning NATO and the NATO countries, particularly uh, countries uh, that are close <laughs> to uh, Russia, uh, worry about what these can do. I mean, we saw in 2008, uh, Russia had these big exercises, not Zapad, but the exercises down in the Caucasus, in the North Caucasus, and they didn't send the troops home. They kept them there and they were in the forefront of those who invaded Georgia. Uh, so, you know, there is a reason, and we just saw this latest huge buildup in Ukraine. Uh, I think the West, particularly in this last uh, round, was very, very clear. Both the United States and Europe made clear the impact uh, on Russia if they were to try to launch military uh, exercises or military uh, attacks against, uh, against Ukraine. Uh, at the same time, I think that Biden laid down, must have laid down the clear markers to Putin that there will be uh, consequences if he were to do something in the military sphere. You know, it's sad. I, I was reading with Deborah the, the uh, interview Putin gave yesterday on the start of uh, the Soviet invasion or the German invasion, the Nazi invasion of uh, Russia, of the Soviet Union, excuse me. And it's it's like you could go back 20, 30, 60 years and, and look at these these same kinds of uh, ideas. Russia still has this idea that somehow territory is uh, is absolutely critical. And he goes after NATO enlargement of the rest of them. NATO hasn't invaded Russia. You know, and every, every time I was uh, asked by Russians, wherever, Russian diplomats, wherever I served, I said, you give me an example of where NATO is a, is somehow a threat to Russia. And the only thing that they can come back to was the bombing of Serbia because of what they did in Kosovo. Uh, but even that was nothing to, to do with Russia. It was just Russia defined its larger interest in the Balkans uh, by allying themselves with Milosevic. But I think NATO is a defensive alliance. And I think deep down the Russian military knows that. But there's it's built into the system that they are uh, still preparing 
if if you will, almost for the for World War Two. Uh, they and and I understand the trauma of World War Two and what happened. I've been there when I was in Moscow. Every city I visited, and I tried to travel all over the country. I put a wreath or flowers at a monument to the Soviet war dead, to not just soldiers, but to civilians who died, because we were allies in that war, and I understand and I sympathize with the huge suffering, but we're, NATO's not going to invade Russia, and I think a lot of the things that uh, that get uh, put out into the Russian uh, press, into the Russia propaganda machine, are, are basically to, to maintain cohesion and support for the regime at home, rather than to actually deal with with uh, a particular threat. That said, we still have to watch Zapad very closely. We have to see what uh, is going to transpire with that. And uh, we need to be to be ready, as always. And I think that's what uh, the Biden administration has agreed with NATO members about when we had the summit this last week. Yeah. And, I, and I think NATO's and individual uh, alliance members and partners' ability to be ready is probably significantly higher now than it was in 2014 or never mind 2028. Mm -hmm. um, next question has to do with kind of uh, internal power dynamics from uh, Lassi Karkan. Uh, what is the current balance of power between different power groups around Putin? Um, how much Putin's internal and foreign policy actions are based on his personal views or are they formed by these power groups in a way and he, he kind of takes them in? Uh, and then, then the last part of this uh, three-part question is, how neutral is the information you think he receives? Are the officials telling him what he wants to hear or what they think he wants to hear or what he probably should hear? All good questions. Uh, my own view is that uh, the clearly the more hardline Siloviki uh, advisors around Putin clearly uh, are in the have been dominant for some time, and we see this not just in terms of foreign policy, but we see this in terms of the repressive policies dealing with demonstrations and Navalny uh, inside of Russia. But you also see it. Elsewhere, uh, one of the things that I was struck before I left Moscow in 2017 was the, the way the FSB was working around Russia in the regions with governors and with businessmen, who I'm sure uh, crossed their palms with a little bit of money, uh, to, pre to, to prevent competition. There's a very famous article, uh, for me it is, uh, written by Andrew Kramer of the New York Times in August of 2017 where he profiled a young man uh, in uh, Novosibirsk, the great science uh, center of, uh, of uh, Western Siberia. He developed a new set of filters or some high-tech uh, device that he was selling to uh, local uh, business people. And uh, lo and behold, he gets arrested. Uh, and it turns out that uh, he's arrested because the local uh, distributor of an old an antiquated technology uh, went to the, his friends in the FSB who preferred the charges and then arrested him and basically tried to stop the business. Now, this is just one example, but I've been told over and over again that this happens all the time. Now, it doesn't happen so much to big uh, corporations, uh, but uh, down at the lower level, uh, Russian entrepreneurs are finding that the this collusion between uh, FSB people with local business people and uh, and uh, political figures uh, can be very very deleterious to the uh, to the economy. Um, I'm trying to remember the question three now. This is the problem um, with three are, questions. Are 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 the are the official telling Putin what he yes wants to hear what he should hear. When I was in Moscow as ambassador, I tried very hard, obviously, like good ambassadors, to keep myself informed. And there were several locations spread out over my three years as ambassador there where people told me that they were in meetings with Putin and he was not as informed as he should have been on some of these issues. Or he had a perspective that clearly he had been had been given uh by one of his one of his aides i think he's pretty well informed of things but you know you see every once in a while uh, uh where he'll take information uh that isn't not necessarily uh, 
either accurate or or it, it's not completely accurate. I always remember, and this goes back a long time to uh, 2000 and. Uh, and five, George uh, W. Bush met with Vladimir Putin in Bratislava. And uh, in the meeting, and then later at the press conference, Putin came out and uh, in response to uh, George, uh, in response to American concerns about freedom of the press in Russia, said, well, of course, George, we know that you fired Dan Rather, the anchor for CBS News. And the Americans, I was told afterwards, inside the room, looked at themselves saying, what, what is this? And uh, he apparently believed this. Now, he clearly had gotten his briefing from somebody in the intelligence community, because I can't imagine that the North America desk at the Russian Foreign Ministry, who know, which follows America very, very closely, would have uh, put him up to say that. And this was not like this current round where they came out and said that these poor, uh, that the people who, uh, uh, the insurrectionists, who attacked the United States Capitol on January 6th were just po political protesters and were being persecuted. That was so clearly a, uh, a propaganda response. Back in, in 2005, it was clear where he was getting his information from, and it, uh, it was inaccurate information. Of course, George Bush pushed back on it. Um, but I think I worried sometimes about getting the message, which is another reason why I think having this meeting early on, uh, and I know some uh, people have criticized Biden for this, but having this early on so that Putin can hear personally, directly from Joe Biden, what his bottom lines are and what he sees for the relationship. I think this is this was so important. This is why I s strongly supported having this meeting, knowing full well that we did not have agreements and all kinds of things to sign. I don't expect those to, to happen, given the depth of our differences uh, and the value differences that uh, we have with Putin uh, in now in uh, his uh, fourth term as president. Uh, thank you. We have uh, one more question here, and then I'm going to leave the last question to Deborah. Um, uh, says, John, what, in your view, was the U.S. message behind lifting the Nord Stream 2 sanctions last month? From Heikki yeah. Swarty. My sense is that this was more about Germany than it was about Russia. Uh, Deborah mentioned that there was a big article uh, by John Hudson in the Washington Post, which delineated the difference between uh, Tony Blinken and the State Department and uh, Jake Sullivan and the NSC. Uh, State Department pushed very hard to, uh, to move forward on that sanctions, but President Biden decided not to. And the, the rationale, which has been laid out in the papers here, is that... Uh, that the pipeline was almost finished, the, that this would uh, inhibit our ability to build a better relationship, not just with the German government today, but with the new German government that's coming. Uh, and that uh, fundamentally the, the pipeline was pretty much finished anyway and would, get be, would be done. I think, I hope that uh, President Biden uh, talked to our allies about uh, the fundamental point here, which is not so much the pipeline per se, but the importance of uh, supporting Ukraine, which gets a billion dollars a year from the transit fees that the Russians send through that pipeline. Uh, I remember even when I was ambassador, Angela Merkel was telling some of our people that they would work out some kind of an arrangement uh, to make sure that Ukraine did not uh, seriously suffer from this. Um, I perhaps have missed something, but I think that's the fundamental point going forward now uh, to try to figure out how this does not uh, seriously harm uh, the Ukrainians and play in to it. But I think this, again, all my friends who know more about this than I do say this was really more a Germany issue here in Washington in the White House than it was a, a Russian issue per se. Okay. Deborah, you, you had a question. Last, you get the last one. I'm going to ask the last question. Um, and that is on effective messaging. Much attention has been paid to Russian disinformation campaigns or information operations and to the increased restrictions on foreign media within, within Russia. John, I want to ask you, how effective are U.S. messaging operations in conveying its national security interests vis-a-vis Russia? Are there tools or techniques that the Biden administration should consider using? Mm -hmm. 
I think that uh, one of the real benefits of a summit like we just had is that uh, Joe Biden was able to get his message across. And I think no matter how much the Russian TV networks are trying to spin things, uh, the messages of a president of the United States at the summit are so dominant now in social media uh, uh, and in other ways that the, the American position comes through in, no, in, 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 in a way that it can't come through any other way. Uh, I worked very hard when I was ambassador and I had much more access. I used to do uh, virtual uh, uh, press conferences and I, I used to do internet press conferences and others to get the message out, particularly to uh, not just the big wire services, but to, to Russian regional media outlets. And everywhere I traveled in Russia, I did interviews all the time. And we got a lot of information about American positions and American culture, and I hope a positive impression of what uh, what America was viewed through the, the American ambassador and his wife as we traveled there. I think that the uh, we, we need to continue to try uh, to use every possible method. It's harder now, and this is, goes back to the question about have, having staff there. Some of the best Russian employees that we had uh, not just in Moscow, but I think probably in every other embassy, are our media specialists, uh, people who understand, who have communications, who have uh, friends and ties, professional relationships with uh, key media people all over. That, that, I think, will be hurt if we don't have the Russian employees there. Um, and no matter how good the American press officer is, no matter how proficient he or she is in Russian, uh, it's still going to be hard institutionally to get the message out. Um, I think we need very much to use the visits of every um, senior American who goes to Moscow. Uh, when I was in Moscow, we had three visits by uh, John Kerry, uh, actually one to Sochi, two to Moscow, and then one by Rex Tillerson uh, when the uh, Trump administration took over. And we use those uh, visits uh, extensively. Uh, I remember specifically Joe ba uh, John Kerry uh, was supposed to meet Vladimir Putin, and Putin was late by two hours. So I suggested that uh, that uh, we leave Spasso House and walk down the Arbat, the famous walking street. Well, as soon as the, this was unscheduled, but as soon as the word got out that uh, John Kerry was walking down the Arbot going to buy Christmas presents for his ki grandkids. You know, we had press coming in from every angle, and it became kind of a sensation on the TV. Now, okay, he didn't do a lot of policy discussions, but he, he was able to do that in the press conference with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov. But what the Russians saw was an American politician, an American Secretary of State, who was able to, who, who, was, who cared about his grandkids. You know, it was the, the message of family and Christmas and the rest of it that kind of went through. And I think that kind of thing just undercuts all of the harsh propaganda that has come to characterize the Putin uh, administration uh, as we've come to the end here. Now, there's a lot of other techniques that you can try to use, but uh, uh, I think we need to keep working on that because in the, in the last analysis, uh, you know, I agree with George Kennan, you know, the father of American study of uh, the Soviet Union and Russia, modern. Uh, Russia, at least, people to people is critical, and we need to keep in get investing, and we do this everywhere. But in Russia, it's uh, it's even more essential. The hard part, as I said earlier, is that the Russian regime, through the foreign agent laws and other things, are trying to to block those, and in the process, are isolating the Russian people from not just the Americans, but from Europeans and others as well. Great, thank, thank you. you. I I think that is a wonderful way to end a super interesting hour. Um, Mention people to people, of course, a critical thing for Finns also living where we do, as well as the high level meetings. Uh, I remember uh, the current Finnish president being criticized roundly as he would continue to meet with Putin after uh, 2014. Uh, but it might have been one of the few people from whom Putin heard a fairly straight story, as it were. Um, so thank you to the audience. Thank you to Ambassador Teft and Ambassador McCarthy. And especially thank you to Mary Louise Hinsberg, Mayu, 
uh, for always setting all these things up so well. Uh, for everyone who celebrates Midsummer, hopefully you have a good Midsummer, and we will see you again in the fall. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie and the FIA team. Thank you very much.